Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another D20 live game. It is 2022. We have all survived. And welcome to the worst tabletop game in the universe, except it's not because they're still fatal. Baron Munchausen, where each of us <laughs> take on the role of some kind of weird aristocrat or whatever the fuck we have come up with with the shit we have left over in our homes. I am, of course, Big Mike. <laughs> It's not about me, though. It's about my players. Starting on, for me, my immediate right, with do the incorrigible and incurable Dr. Tara Wise. Hello! Uh, I am Connell Macbeth, known better in the nerd community as Dr. Tara Wise. T today, uh, I'm going to be, like, the pirate of the Hudson's Bay. <laughs> pirate king of the fucking Hudson's Bay there, bud. <laughs> and after him, of course, is Tom. He is an evil genius white. Hello? Um, I'm Tommy Zanier with Genius White. I do the show Weird Video Games on YouTube, and today I am playing Baron Doctor Zealot Beef Stupid Esquire a Space Bazooka the Fourth the Third. All right, and I believe has Jordan's camera frozen. Uh, Jordan, I think so. Jordan yeah. froze on a and a look of mixture of joy and shock. Okay, we'll, we'll get him I, back in a second. To a T, I think. <laughs> and after him, of course, is Byron. Buddy, I'm Byron, and today, once again, I will be playing the part of Lord Archibald Busybody. And following him, of course, is Tom with, I believe, a new character. Hello, everyone. Yes, I decided last minute to switch my character. Uh, I will now be playing Lord Archimedes Kane, Snake Oil Baron of the South. And Jordan is back, so we can do his intro properly now. Oh, sorry. As soon as Sam was like, three, two, one, my intro was like, nope, and just cut it for some reason. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what... As soon as you said one, I was like, nope, to cut. Nope. That was hilarious. Okay, oh, sorry. Cool. I am Grand Sparkle Lord Reginald Von Kittybottom, Archbishop of the Deep Cinnamon Bun Swamp. And last, but most assuredly not least, Nash from Radio Dead Air. Nah, it's, it's kind of least. I, um, I'm Nash from Radio Dead Air. Live stream for ages and ages. Do uh, what the fuck is wrong with you on um, YouTube and I game stream and um, I'm going to reserve the name of my fellow till we actually get it. Okay. Oh, hello. I love, I love that right. you have a stream now that will never run out of content. Which it, is what the fuck Jesus is wrong with you? Christ. I have got. <laughs> I've joked for decade. Literally, <laughs> I've been doing this for a decade. I've joked the entire decade that I have job security. Yeah. Bad. <laughs> so. Tonight, as I have said, we are playing Baron Munchausen. Of course, the announcements next week, D20 Live, we'll be doing another craft check where you can come in and ask us questions. We will answer do answers. Followed up by a return to our Angoria long game. And just a reminder, the D20 Live stream does close today. You mean to the D20 Live survey. Sorry, the D20 Live survey uh, does close today for people who want to get in their input and last minute checks. If one of our moderators could put the link in the chat and we'll kindly have that information and tell us what you think about us and the fun stuff we do here from last year. Uh, two people have followed. Kelswitch01 has followed, and Mosling has also followed us. Thank you very hey, much. Mosling. Hey. Thank you. Thank so, you. You will regret that choice. <laughs> so, also, as hello, everybody. Is. I'm Sam, the production manager. You can see me today yep. as I'm technically moderating this entire thing. So, uh. Sam, uh... Would you like to take us through the basic rules of Baron Munchausen that we will inevitably destroy? All right. So, as many of you who, who may know or may not know, uh, the Extraordinary Adventures of Baron Munchausen is a role-playing game in which you tell fabulous stories under three minutes. <laughs> and uh, basically what happens not is the happen. other players can interrupt <laughs> uh, using coins. However, because of the fact that we are in many different places and all online... Um, not allowed to see each other in person. We're not having any coins. But uh, what can happen is people, uh, you, the audience, can actually interrupt with $1 uh, s saying, but Baron or but Lord or but whoever is telling the story. And you can interject and also say, but what about this? Right? So if Mike is saying... Ah. <laughs> if Mike is, is coming up with a, uh, a story about how his hunting dog beauty caught several hares at once you could say but baron hares are a myth if you donate one dollar <clears throat> uh if you donate five dollars um <laughs> I, sorry i laughed at that 
and I inhaled a bit of my mustache. <laughs> You're the one who said blue doesn't exist. So. Yep. The sky uh, doesn't that exist. That was my go-to strategy last year was just to claim everything was a myth or didn't exist. So if the if the audience donates five dollars, they can have their suggestion read out as, instead of one of the prompts from the book, because there are many, Ooh. many, many prompts in this book. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so uh, generally my job here is today is just to make sure that they are one uh, staying on topic and two the fact that they actually make it under three minutes. But yeah. Uh, that's about it. They can make whatever else they want. Please don't be racist uh, in your suggestions, people. Uh, or please, bigoted. Or in bigoted. Or why, why does that mm -hmm. have to be an instruction? I know, God right? Damn it. <laughs> it's just a safety precaution. A safety I trust precaution? all of you. You will always have a job, Nash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you will always have a job. <laughs> I wanted to make a joke and say um, the exception is if it's against the French in the spirit of the game, but then I'm afraid oh, yeah, people yeah. will actually take that seriously. And... Yeah. <laughs> you live close enough to Quebec. Somebody could find your ass. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I realize I need to get my timer up. Um, who would like to go first? That's a good question. Uh, I will go first. All right. All righty. Okay. I'll throw myself into the proverbial sandworm. There we are. Okay. <laughs> I need his name up here. Grand Sprinkle Lord Reginald Von Kitty Bottom. Yes? Please, you speak to me? Please tell us the story of how you circumvented the world without leaving your house. Oh, wow. This is really timely. <laughs> wow. I, I think you mean circumnavigated, because if he circumvented the world, that's an entirely different thing. Circumnavigated, yes. That is the word. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he froze when. Oh, there he is. He was, he was in right. his okay. knees for a while. Yeah. There. <laughs> like, literally, like, looked like he was with his eyes rolling backwards in his head, like, fuck me, and then just froze in that state for the rest of his life. Um, so, that's actually quite easy to explain. Um, the Grand Sparkle Lord has access to gnomish magic, you see, and um, I have. Uh, was able to um, have my house circumnavigate the, the globe through a series of balloons and weather machines that I control through my uh, own tinkering and invention. Oh yeah, that'll work. Yeah. Oh, but Grand Sparkle yeah, no, Lord, he's got... a question. A question. Yes. What's that? Do not the people of Prussia? Actually, I should have. I should have an accent. Should not. Do not the people of Prussia have an open bounty out on all forms of dirigibles? Um, yes, they would be, except it's a house attached to balloons, not a balloon attached to a house, you see. Oh, so there is a di there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I lord. think that's a legal distinction. Ah, but my lord, I must ask, is it not true the entire country of Australia has a vendetta against balloons and will attack them on sight? How did uh, you get past that? Well, the thing is, I skirted them to the north um, and went through the Polynesian region as opposed to the Australian coast, which we all know, um, as our good friend here, hates balloons and everything to do with them because of the popping noise you see. It startled them. Yeah, that's It startles right. the Australians. Yeah, yes. Great. They start they startle easily, like deer. I do have a question, though. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. So I know that the propulsion for your weird house balloon thing goes on based on these tiny, like, fucking legs and arms that stick off the bottom of the house, and they kick and paddle through the air and such. And I know that that's a whole yes. thing, but how do you yes. feed them? Uh, it's, uh, we take donations from the, uh, Cinnamon Bun Swamp. Um, the, uh, entire building is funnel, is, uh, powered through, uh, Cinnamon Bun uh, Refuse. Good so we're talking about crumbs and um, the juices left over in the pan at the end of a cinnamon bun tray. You know what I mean? Like the, and so by having all of these dirty pans down there, they not only fuel the house, but also clean my dishes. So really, well, it's efficient. a two for one situation, that's, and that's, it's that's quite solid. good. That's efficient, yeah. Yeah, it's very efficient, actually, yes. My lord? Yes, sir. How was it, how was it you were able to evade the monsters in the locks of Scotland. Um, quite easily. Locks. In fact, what I ended up doing was uh, we ended up parking on top of the head of one of the Loch Ness monsters. There's more than one. 
damn it! Oh no! <laughs> He's taking uh, a moment to collect his thoughts. by the Loch Ness monster. I'm getting some wicked though, fucking screenshots of him and Frozen. Right. Sorry. You're back. <laughs> so we actually parked on one of the Loch Ness monsters for a little while. Uh, there's actually a family of them plugging up the lock. That's why it even exists in the first place. Um, they're wedged in the in in the uh, port between the uh, the lock and the ocean. Whoops. So, time. is that time? Yeah, I, oh, that I have, oh, I had so many more questions. <laughs> oh, that's oh. so short. This is going to be difficult. <laughs> yeah. Oh, What's up? Rob, Hag Rob Hagen has donated one dollar, um, but he didn't interject with something. <laughs> so we just took his money. Oh, Rob. <laughs> just one dollar. Thanks, Rob. Uh, <laughs> he didn't write anything. <laughs> okay. Did we Bell. get to five minutes instead of three? Yeah, we, we're going to need more time. Okay. We're very full yeah, of shit. We'll Jordan, how time. about you get an extra two minutes then? Wondrous. Excellent. Continue. <laughs> All right. Now, Barry. So, oh Lord, Sparkle Boy. Oh, Sparkle Boy. Sparkle Boy, I'm going to go a question for you now. How did you avoid altitude poisoning because of the fact that every time you pooped, it would have just fallen out of the house, thus lowering the weight of the house and causing the house to rise? This I is a good know. question. Thank you. I, I have thought about it for three seconds. I also had a question about the Loch Ness monsters that I'd like to return yes, to. Yes, continue, continue. Okay. I can maybe answer both questions at the same time. Go ahead. Okay, well, uh, but is it true that uh, the Loch Ness monsters hate each other and would not cooperate to help you in your endeavor? Well, you see, both things are true, and we did suffer an acute altitude poisoning after we were launched into the air due to the hatred of the Loch Ness monsters of themselves. Um, we got caught up in their family drama, unfortunately. They do like to hit each other with their long necks, so it's more like a... <laughs> So they smack each other, their heads together, sort of like in a ramming motion. Like a giraffe. Like a, yeah, like a G. <laughs> this sounds plausible enough to be correct, yes. Like a giraffe, that's right. Um, so um, they whip each other, and because we were parked on the heads of one of them, unfortunately we were launched into low, or low earth, earth orbit. And this is how we were able to circumnavigate the, uh, the the Earth so quickly, but unfortunately did acutely poison ourselves due to the altitude. I don't think anyone has any more questions for you. Any more <laughs> questions? Ujaka. Children? Oh, I've got one. If was that? Ujaka Shah has followed. Okay, I have one. Now, all right then, Good Lord, Lord Sparkabottom, I've got one last question. How were yes. you able, when in your circumnavigating, to land back at home, considering the Canadian housing market is literally the worst thing in the universe right now? Five seconds. We're supposed to tell outlander stories, Mike. <laughs> 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 and we're done. We're Did I kill this time? <laughs> All right, Eddie froze. Yes, the truth scared him so much worse than any of our lies. <laughs> okay, who wants to go next? <laughs> Oh, I will. I'll get this over with. All righty then. <clears throat> Lord Admiral Archibald Busybody. Yes. Please tell us the story of how your choice of... Oh, wait, no, never mind. We did that last year. The mistake with your laundry which saved the court of France from drowning. Oh, God, it's not the French again. <laughs> well, as you all know, um, I have gotten quite a lot of cotton over my years, as well as silks along the Silk Road, and I've accumulated quite a large number of clothing and clothing items. Now, at this point, France, much like Venice, was starting to sink under its own bullshit. Now, at this point... I see the spark of bottom did in fact break, that's good. Uh, now, there needed to be Not new parts of... <laughs> There needed to be an influx of water and proper mortar in order to raise France back up to its normal height of bullshittery and, and, well, well, of course, now, my laundry. I needed to use several rivers, including the Seine, the Rhine, as well as the River Thames in order to combi <clears throat> combine and clean all of my clothing. And the rush of water, clean water, made its way to France and stabilized itself, so that way the bullshit... Yes, Reginald. 
That's you, Jordan. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, Reginald. How in the world did you possibly clean your clothes at the Thames when it's made mostly of poop? Well, we put it in an expensive filtration system near Buckingham Palace, which is how oh, we I've heard of those. Keep... Yes, which is how we need <laughs> to keep the Thames clean. clean I hear the Queen pristine. keeps all the shit to herself. That is quite true. It's all the corgis, you know. Naturally. So with the clean Thames water, I was able to clean my clothing, and thus the water levels rose back in France, stabilizing the bullshit under it, and thus saving France okay. once again. Rob, Rob has interrupted. Vice Admiral Fuzzy Bottom, aren't the French actually noticed by decree of the king? Is he supposed to answer that, or am I? You are supposed to answer that. It's Well, as we all know, France is where God forgot. So naturally, <laughs> the godless heathens of France choose to wear clothing. That's a well-known well fact. Mm -hmm. That is a well-known fact, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, sir. But yes, but the fact that they didn't have any clothing meant my clothing had to be cleaned and cleansed in order to raise them back up and save their horrible province, even though they have ridiculous, horrible nudists smelling of cheese and indifference. <laughs> I have a question. Do I have actually? any other questions from the gallery? Yes. I do, actually. I have a question, as my accent keeps yeah. shifting every 12 seconds. Now, how are you able to bathe your clothes in the rind when, in fact, the rind is just another form of cheese? You just have the rind of it. Well, there's the Rhine River in Germany, my friend, that we use, which is a more efficient and powerful river. Thus, I was able to clean my clothes more efficiently there, sending the water back to France and saving them once again. All right. I don't have a good response to that. <laughs> While I was eating because rhymes and cheese as well. Ah. Anyone else? Um, what sort of cheese are you talking? Surely not French cheese. Oh, of course not. Proper cheddar, sir. We don't eat anything but any of that French cheese. I, I sucked on great cheddar and the German cheeses and the Belgian cheeses. I, of course, avoided the French cheeses because they give terrible wind. Well, where did terrible you procure these wind. cheeses? Because they're outlawed in France. Yes. Now, I do have a question, my Lord Admiral. <laughs> yes, American. Why would you bother saving the entire country of France if there wasn't something in it for you? As we well, all know, the French don't accept charity and will demand something in return. Well, much like how France pulls everyone else into wars, if the country of France sinks into the ground, every single other country will be pulled in along with it. It is a load-bearing and horrible country, sir. Ah, makes sense. Anyone else? I'm trying not to I'm laugh good. very hard into my microphone. We have 56 seconds left. All right. Oh, this pause. is not a laughing matter, good uh, I, sir. I, it's I, a load-bearing country the question, entire though. country. No. They are a load-bearing country, yes. Yes, sir. L no, no, but how did you procure this cheddar when it is illegal in France? Nah, well, you see, I had it sent to me by my carrier flamingos. <laughs> they came from Dover over the channel, and they brought it to me while I was supping and having my clothes cleaned by my pages. Ah, oh, the flamingos, fuck. <laughs> yes. Perfectly pink as they're coming over the horizon. I laughed, and I waved to them, and they gave me my cheddar. From oh, cheddar. But, but my lord, is it not true that the color pink doth set the French countrymen into a rage unheard of outside of Scotland? The mere well, sight of that color should have triggered them all. Naturally, Kevin, <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Axe is trying to confuse me again, sir. Now... Yes, you are quite correct. Pink does send them into horrible rage. There's nothing we can do about that because the French raging, well, the French can rage all they want. Nobody really cares. Baron, you're at time. All right, we're at time. <laughs> oh my god, this is good. All right. <laughs> well done. Uh, okay, who would like to go next? I'll Should give we it just go. roll a die or something? Nash would like to go. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, Lord Henry James Edward St. James the Fifth and a Half. <laughs> Please. He has a tell twin us. brother, of course. He's the other half. No, <laughs> it's because it's because Medal only comes up to here. <laughs> Please tell us the story of. He's from Wales. 
Please tell us the story of why you claim to be the husband of Cleopatra. Okay, well, you see, the thing is, my family, we we have our money in sheep, which is really hard on the sheep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we had to come up with a creative way to avoid the taxes on the money, because where we are up in the highlands, the taxes are very hard because we are, as you know, very stingy people. So in order to avoid the taxes, we had to get them out of the country. So we had to load the sheep on boats and head them down the Nile, which doesn't connect to Europe at all, which made it very difficult to send them down the river. Um, I leave that to the people who we gave the money to. Um, so, but in order to make sure I could establish a residence in, in Egypt, I had to, to, to claim, you know, it was a green card marriage, which is very, <laughs> which is very odd because we haven't even invented green cards yet. Um, I have a question though. Would yes. not the special properties of the water in the Nile cause all the sheep to inflate to incredible mass? I thought the same thing. But I didn't want to hurt their feelings by mentioning it. So... <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> um... Fuck, he's got you there, bud. <laughs> it, se it, it seemed impolite. You so... didn't want to fat shame them. No, so they are. Yes, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it matters. I was, I was brought up right, I think. Yeah, fucking shame um, on you, doctor. <laughs> so we had to. So I, we could, since they hadn't invented green cards yet, I couldn't exactly be married to Cleopatra. See, so I had to claim I was while we waited for the concept of of legalized citizenship to be accepted. And we're we've got about another couple hundred years before that's true. All right, Lord, no, but my lord. Rob, sorry, hang on. Rob Hagen has has uh, tipped a, do a dollar. Lord Halfpint, how did you avoid the fangs, horrible snakes that inhabited Cleopatra's hair? Well, <laughs> you see, the thing is, <laughs> I wait your answer. This yes, gentleman's see. table, sir. You will answer the insane question. I didn't come all the way from across the sea to listen to you silence. Well, you see, the thing is, the Egyptian snakes don't speak English. All right? So, pretty well much, known, yes. we, we, we managed to keep the problem at bay due to a language barrier. <laughs> yeah, that works right. very well. For being, for being reductive there, Rob. Fuck. <laughs> I see, it's just like me dealing with all the other people on my ranches. I don't speak Paul. Now, I've got an interesting question brought up by Colin DeLorean in the chat here. Okay. All of these sheep who you didn't want to hurt their feelings and such going down the river. Right. Why do they call it then the Trail of Shears? <laughs> oh, fuck, that's a good one. <laughs> pretty, I thought it was pretty fucking clever. <laughs> so I thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> you can, I think can't you should donate a dollar, but maybe to. one of us can get the spot of a dollar because it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nash, you do have the option to reject the question if you can't handle it. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's a good no, but, um, well, I mean, it's, it's well known that, that sheep are attracted to fun. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, we, we tend to encourage that in the flock because it keeps cohesion in the group. The puns, you say. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> now, sir, I have a question. With you extracting that many sheep from the Highlands, how did you not become it? How did you prevent it from becoming another recognized national tragedy in Scotland? Well... We had to give them a little bit of a vacation first, you know, just get it out of the system. We don't, it, a gentleman d doesn't tell and, and the sheep doesn't kiss, so. Now, my lord, I do have a follow-up question, if you what? don't mind. Now I know you're from Wales. 
My lord, I do have a question. You said you floated these sheep down the Nile River, is that correct? That is correct. Then how did you deal with the Nile crocodiles? As we all know, their union controls the Nile River like no one's business. As a result, I you should have paid tariffs up the wazoo good, sir. I know they do. And they're very shrewd negotiators, I'll tell you what. Um, so the first thing you have to do when you're dealing with crocodiles, right? You have to get down on their level. And they're very flat. They're very flat. The crocodiles, they, they flatten themselves out very well. So you have to make sure you're very thin. Um, we employed a number of limbo poles to train us to be on the same level as the crocodile, right? So we had to get eye to eye and talk on the same level. Um, they respected us for making the effort. And we got a bit of a discount. All right, Kandash, you're at time. Okay. <laughs> So well done. Oh, uh, well done. Well done. Well fucking done, man. <laughs> well done. All right. So, uh, Tom uh, Smith, uh, you have got a uh, a prompt for you. It is. Uh, it's from oh, I SMV shall do my best not USA. to disappoint. So it's from SMV4 USA. It says Tom Lord Kane. Uh, hang on. Full name. We need the full name. One second. Uh. Lord Archimedes Cain, my dear. Oil Baron of the South. Uh, please tell us the time you made contact with autonomous artificial beings that take the form of horseless carriages. Oh, ho, ho. this is one of my favorite stories. You see, it started off with a gopher hole. See, I was minding my fields, searching for oil, as I often do every Thursday between hours of four to six. Every other day I find one, but this day, sadly, I lost a dear horse as it tripped into the gopher patch and was lost to the depths of the earth. I managed to jump off, and I realized this must be a gopher of unimaginable size if, if one of its in their holes could swallow an entire horse. And so, left in the fields of one of my vast, vast tracts of land, I decided the only thing to do was to hunt down that gopher and make it my own. It was on my land, it was mine, it was my property. That was the only thoughts going through my dead head. Did you marry That's that gopher? That's the Magna Carta, yes. <laughs> and I did not marry that gopher, sir. My wife would have found that very offensive. Is your so wife anyway. also a gopher? <laughs> She's a goer, if that's what you're asking, but she ain't no gopher, sir. <laughs> now, as I was saying, I realized that if a gopher had a hole big enough to swallow a damn horse, I would need something faster than a horse to track it underground. So I compiled the greatest engineers America and Mexico had to offer. Because as we all know, Canadian engineers cannot function unless it's device built on top of snow. Their schooling only develops things for snow. Yeah, we just so, use Chesky Terriers. <laughs> <laughs> so, assembling the greatest engineers most of the good parts of North America can acquire. They developed an outstanding device using gears and steam to crawl amongst the dirt. And they called it the Go-Go Dirt Machine. Using this go-go dirt machine, I tracked down that gopher. It was bigger than I could imagine. It was as large as the smallest house that I own. Uh, oh, you what? all can imagine. <laughs> but <isn't>... Please imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't there an actual patent on a go-go dirt machine actually owned by Thomas Edison? Oh. Who do you think I got to build it for him? Who do you think's finances is crazy ideas? You see, I picked him over Nikola Tesla for one very, very important reason. Oh, that's a better begin. Honestly, I forgot the real. I think it was just because I didn't like his name. Tesla. Doesn't roll off the tongue I've at all. Tesla has a bit of a musk about it. <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed. He got a foul musk about him. Right. It smells of intelligence and ethics. Uh, we have a we Wait, have no. interruption from the audience. It says, Lord Redneck, how did you survive the repeated treachery of the autonomous flying horseless carriages known as Starscream? 
I was hoping y'all never find out about Starscream. Well, you see, during the development process, you go through many phases, and one of them early prototypes, well, it took a dark and dangerous turn. See, that there one, for some reason, was powered by evil, as apparently it was more cost-effective than oil. <laughs> oil is cool enough. We don't need to be killing horses to give this thing a soul. Just power it by oil. But Edison was, oh no, it's more cost-effective, sir. So I said, fine, make it happen. And of course, once the thing achieved sentience, it was really hard to convince it to do what I want. So I had only one choice. I sent it to a boarding school in Europe so it wouldn't be my problem no more, just like I do with my kids. <laughs> well, wouldn't you know it, three years later it comes back all fancy-like, demanding revenge, just like my kids. So, I did the same thing I do with them. I found another use for that there gopher hole, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Well, anyway, that went down there. Turns out a whole bunch of them got together. They formed what they called the Revengers Association, where five of my kids and a robot named Starscream worked together and putting on each other's shoulders, they climbed out of that hole. And that's when I first developed the true horseless carriage. Because I realized that if any other automaton, as they're called, did achieve sentience, they might actually win a fight. So, this was the only time I commissioned both Edison and Tesla to work on a machine. I said, I want it to be faster. I want it to be stronger. And I don't want it to be no intelligent machine. All right, and you're at time. I have so much more to say, good lady. I, have... <laughs> I was not interrupted nearly as many times as I need. Stop to get a word in edgewise, bud. It was too good, man. What do you want? Yeah, sounds like the optimist way to get things done. Oh. <laughs> oh. Might You're say it was fired. a hard situation. Well, I guess I'll finish that story another time. Or for $10 if the audience really wants it. <laughs> All right. Who would like to go next? <laughs> people left <laughs> all of the top Just... row <laughs> i can go if not i'm gonna start to... okay mike's gonna go yeah all right so all right hit me, hit me with it you little sheila samantha sheila light <laughs> oh, God. okay governor <laughs> gary baldersnatchy yo you're <clears throat> pronouncing it wrong down under we pronounce it all right Please tell us the tale of why a man in Dublin has a contract stating he owns your right leg. That's a fascinating story, actually. You see, as an Australian, we are, of course, natural like criminals. So we have to use all kinds of ways to kind of geriatrically and retroactively form a legal parliamentary system. Much like making a prom dress out of carpet samples. So in order to make sure that I was a legal holding person in Australia, I needed to find a different educational and legal body to allow me to have legal precedence to own anything. And to do so, I technically, technically had to engage in a form of legal balderdashy <laughs> by selling parts of my anatomy on the open market so that way I legally counted in Dublin. And as we know, the Dublin economy is unshakable. That's true. So, it's known for that. It's true. I made my way up to the lovely place of Dublin in the nation that it is in. That I have not forgotten the name of. <laughs> Ireland! And You're doing terrific. <laughs> the finest education that Australia has to offer right there. Right there. <laughs> and proceeded... To solicit my leg. Of course, based on my outfit, many people had come to the alternative idea that I was offering my body for things other than pure real estate legislature. So I had to beat off many suitors. No one's sorry, interrupting me, now? which frightens me on several levels. Now, my lord, I do have a quick question for if and you don't mind. I welcome your inquiries. 
If a news was selling your body parts to the highest bidder to various people, what's for stopping them from claiming them and hacking them off you? Ha <laughs> ha! That was half the excitement, actually. You see, I was an under-boxing champion in Australia, which is just boxing, but it's down under. <laughs> so anyone who actually tried to claim my body parts had to get me in a best two out of three tickle pull fight. And I have never lost a tickle pull fight with man, beast, or automaton named Starscream. Well, that's just tradition there. Oh, yeah. So while running around in Dublin, I found myself in a unique circumstance where five men wanted one my leg because I had proven its incredible f physical abilities by kicking exactly three old nuns and getting away with it, which made it fearsome um, and an act of God. But how are, you, how are you able to fight off all these people if um, your other leg had already been claimed from uh, the Queen of Belgium? You see, the Queen herself was quite enamored by my fighting prowess of my other leg, so she gave me a free open license to for combat in Dublin. Um... Governor Boldersnatch, you didn't Dublin ban all Australians as per the terms of the treaty that ended the Fifth Emu War. That's why in Dublin, <laughs> I am known as David Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> and since they banned the Australians, they don't actually recognize the accent anymore. Nor do I, in the rate that which I have distorted this into a horrible nightmare of accents. <laughs> so really, I was in the clear. <laughs> But my lord, did not the Belgians, the Australians, and the Irish not sick their feral lawyers on you that are fed only one Bible a week? <laughs> That's why I started stealing, taking payment. Not stealing, I took payment in Bibles, just in case, strategically. I needed to deploy decor Bibles. They were more. Yeah, if you crush them up into crumbs and sprinkle them across the floor, that keeps them there busy for days. Mm -hmm. Palm 27, <laughs> stop them right in their tracks in the middle of the thoroughfare. They have to count them like like vampires. Exactly like <laughs> vampires. Okay, but at the time, was the Bible not yet translated into Australian? <laughs> <laughs> that there does sound like a true fact, my lord. You better answer that right quick. <laughs> Holy exactly. shit! Just I want to read an Australian read Bible. The good book doesn't mean I can't appreciate it. I have so many body parts across Europe for different versions of the Bible. I have only deplored them. Regrettably, as an crikey. Australian, I cannot read, and you are being very cruel to my disability. Or your what? My disability! He's saying he's illiterate because their school system ain't dumber than a slug. I am sorry to every Australian watching this <laughs> right now, which I know. No, you don't have to apologize to them. They can't hear you anyways. We're <laughs> <up>. <laughs> hey, you're in time. <laughs> oh, thank God for all all this sleep right now. <laughs> I, I wasn't paying attention. What the fuck did I just say? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> you insulted damn near everyone on the south end of the equator, my good sir. Well done on my own, mate. My accent's falling apart like my prom dress. Alright. <sighs> move on. Um, Pirate King of the Hudson's Bay there, bud. Hi. Um, please, please regale us. I'm the us Dread with Captain the Bay story. Hudson of the Hudson's Bay. <laughs> please regale us with the story of how you invented the tomato. <laughs> <laughs> I am both intrigued and confused. <laughs> and how did you get those wily Italians to accept it so readily as an eco economic unit? Oh, unfortunately, I will get to that. Uh, <laughs> so the year, of course, was 1672, and there I was, pirating out of the Hudson's Bay, as per usual. We only get about three good fucking months a year to do this with the ice and such. And our boat, no, has no propulsion beyond a bit of rowing, and of course, since the, the slipstream's been moving around much as it has been, all we have to do is clear the bay, and then the sea just carries us wherever we need, right? Occasionally, you run into a few good pirates out there looking for a good scrap, a proper Donnybrook. But we don't have to worry about anything of that sort, you see, because when we sail upon them, all we have to do is show them our big bare chests, and their ships just burst into flames, and I think good for them. <laughs> but we were looking for ourselves something that wasn't quite a fruit, it wasn't quite a vegetable, and we thought that if we got enough people arguing over it, 
that it would get us out of a lot of scraps. A lot of scraps we didn't want to be in, you see. So we took cherries and we took cucumbers and we put them together in a bunch of soil and played just, just the smoothest music. Just the best darn <laughs> berry gigolo you ever heard. <laughs> and it cropped the tomatoes. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why do the Italians like it so much? And that's because the Italians are very confusing people. They live in a country shaped like a boot, don't you know? <laughs> what are you laughing about? All of this is true so far. <laughs> Eventually getting over there, we figured that if we could sell them the most confusing fucking vegetable fruit on the face of the earth, that they'd make that the central part of their own currency. And boy, did they ever. Oh, but my lord. How on earth did you overtake the aubergine eggplant as the most confusing vegetable? It's pronounced aubergine! Well, the aubergine eggplant, don't you know, is just an eggplant, but it's covered in gold poop. <laughs> and they get that from ostriches that are down in the Australias, you see. Because everything's upside down and fucking backwards there, so they poop gold. Little soft gold, little, it's like soft serve comes out of them as a liquid at first. And all you have to do is you dip the eggs in it, in this case the eggplants. That's how you get the aubergine eggplants, and we figured we could do one better by mixing fruits and vegetables and getting people to argue over it for fucking ever. Okay, we got one from the audience. It says, hey there, buddy. Isn't it true, guy, that tomatoes is merely an overroasted potato covered in red sauce, pal? They used to be before the 1600s, bud. Because <laughs> they were looking for something to call a tomato because we found the word to be so fucking interesting. We like saying it back and forth, tomato. And other people would say tomato or some other ugly shit like that, but you know, it wasn't enough of a fight, it wasn't confusing enough, and they were just painting potatoes red. And we figured if we put seeds in them and made them juicy and then poisonous to most of the fucking human race, until they eat it enough that it stops poisoning them, like their own personal version of culinary Stockholm Syndrome, <laughs> that, you know, we could get to <laughs> we could get to it. Now, my lord, I do have a secondary question there for you. Absolutely. Now, I may not be much of a botanist, but I do know tomato plants do well in the heat. So how in the Sam hell did you grow them up in the frigid winters of Canada? Now, you might not be much of a botanist, but are you much of a Bibleist, good sir? <laughs> I believe I have read the Bible exactly none times. Indeed. <laughs> anybody knows that no matter where you are, no matter how cold, no matter how dark, if you read certain passages from the Bible, a big warm light comes down from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Shines out of Dodd's asshole. That's what goes across the sky every day when it's warm. Makes sense. That's what we use to grow these fucking things. <laughs> okay. And I'll but... tell you, there's nobody more religious than the fucking Italians. <laughs> <laughs> well, his story checks out. Okay. <laughs> Except, sir, that uh, you say that you grew these tomatoes in Canada and that you played <sighs> music but music had not been invented in Canada yet. No, it had not. We kept it to ourselves. It was a national secret at that point. It wasn't publicly available. Uh, yeah, I heard about that, but them Canadians said sea shanties were their original uh, Canadian song of sorts. Yeah, sea shanties is where they got their start, but that wasn't until about the 1700s or so. In the early 16s, we were just singing very quietly to ourselves in the loo. <laughs> Well, that's the only time you're allowed to sing or make noise. I said, what is wrong with you lords? This is a serious conversation, and you dare to snicker in like a bunch of sickle wits. If you made too much noise outside the loo, then the meese would get you. That's multiple <laughs> for moose. Actually, I have a question. I've understood that it. in Canada, you have a massive black fly problem. How'd you get the little bastards to stop from eating all your damn tomato? Oh, fuck, that was the time. <clears throat> Well, I'll tell you a quick answer to that. You see, you got to run real fast. You got to run so fast across the land. It's so very cold up there. They can't keep up with you beating their wee wings in the in the icy frozen north. But I tell you, after about a day and a half of jogging like that, you got to piss the goddamn bag. <laughs> and that's when you go in the loo and have yourself a little sing. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Dread Captain Bay Hudson, Hudson's Bay. <laughs> <clears throat> So we do have one from the uh, from the audience for uh, Baron Doctor Zealot Beef Stupid Esquire's Space Bazooka the Fourth the Third. Um, mm -hmm. Please oh, explain how you managed to set up a means to siphon money away from your fellow lords without their knowledge. Whoops. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, can you repeat that, please? Please explain how you managed to set up a means to siphon money away from your fellow lords without their knowledge. Oops. Well, um, there aren't uh, a tremendous number of uh, lords in the, the part of the Canada that I came from, which is uh, this one. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, most of the uh, most of the money I got, I channeled through various um, backwoods uh, orange factories. And uh, see, oranges are not really um, touched upon by most uh, European lords. Uh, a few Canadians know about them, but I managed to uh, trick them into um, a, a sort of lord exchange so that the European lords would come to Canada and the uh, Canadian lords would go to Europe and they'd be none the wiser to any of the money being funneled through orange factories. It's true, I have no idea what an orange is. <laughs> now, my lord, me as much I do that have a tomato question. shit and we had earlier. <laughs> <laughs> my lord, I do have a quick question for you there. Uh, yes. That might have worked for many of the other simpletons on this here chat we have. But as you may have not oh, noticed, where? I am not European. I am a proud from the person of the South. So what how did you like? trick me? Because I know what an orange is, sir. Well, I, I did say Canadian. I didn't say American. Uh, I've heard of stuff. I've heard of oranges. I've never fucking seen one though. <laughs> I think they're a myth. No, I mean, I mean, obviously the the oranges had to be brought in from the South. So I worked in cooperation with uh, many other people. I, I thought your name was on the document, actually. No. Could very well be. I do a lot of illegal trades. My lord doctor. Yes. As has now been revealed that you've been siphoning money from the rest of us, how is it you were able to evade taxman? Because if you were able to evade us, but you certainly could not avoid tax. Okay, well, see... Uh, most goods are uh, taxable, but not lemons, and I managed to convince the uh, Canadian government that my oranges were in fact lemons, uh, which, due to the Treaty of 1876, are both considered citrus. Dude, remember that treaty? I think I was a signature on it. Damn my eyes, I did, I did sign that treaty as well. Now, my lord, I do have a much more serious question there. Mm hmm now, you yourself being a doctor, I assume you have taken the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm unto others, correct? Uh, yes. Then how in the Sam hell have you been distributing oranges, which as we all know, are the single most toxic fruit to humans alive? The single smell of an orange can cause a man to go catatonic. How do you ethically say you've done this? Well, well that is a very good point. Uh, unfortunately, I actually broke my Hippocratic Oath many times before this. Uh, the first time was when I um, accidentally uh, stapled two gerbils together and uh, set them into the south. And, uh, <laughs> just like, where they... I'm like, how'd you get around your Hippocratic Oath with all this stuff? Well, you see, I just didn't follow it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I mean, uh, like, the great, very practical. The great stapled the gerbil bush fire that was unfortunately my dog, uh, which was both an accident and slightly on purpose depending on um which nitty gritty you want to focus on all right we have one from the audience dr bazooka yes. smithy uh the three quarters <laughs> isn't that scheme uh just what they call a nifty freaking thing aka an nft oh boo <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, that that term was actually named after the things that I did, although uh, most people would say Kanye did it. Um, <laughs> it's uh, I think he popularized it, but I was definitely the first. I don't think any of us have a good response to that. He's very good. <laughs> All right, now I got one. Now, yes. as you know, Doctor, oranges do spoil after a certain period of time. If you were siphoning all your funds as in form of citrus, how did you prevent it from going bad? Uh, well, many of them actually were just rocks that were painted orange. You, you, we had to um, put them in in a sort of ratio of like one rock to nine oranges, uh, so as not to um, so as not to arouse suspicion. So uh, whenever an orange would get would go bad, we would replace it with a different rock. Sometimes we use potatoes. Sometimes uh, I, I, <laughs> I see my colleague here nodding. He knows all about the painted potatoes trade. That's I just math. <laughs> it is. 
Uh, that's that's all it is. My lord, I do have a very important follow-up question now I do have to ask. <clears throat> now that you done told these fools you stole from them, how are you going to evade their fiery wrath? Oh, well, see, uh, the money is already spent. <laughs> That'll do uh, it. They... <laughs> you don't think that that's going to stop them from, I don't know, maybe hiring some kind of a llama-based assassin to go after you? <laughs> oh, but I, I'm invisible to all llamas. It's a, a, an invention I created. That's where I spent all my money. I have it on good fucking authority that we're actually talking to an elaborate recording and that he's been dead for 50 <laughs> years at this point. <laughs> Explain a lot. And we're at time. We're at time. Oh, okay. I think that's the round, actually. That is the round, yes. Oh, <laughs> I got to oh, this fucking thing. Wow. <laughs> Excellent work, gentlemen. Excellent work. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> go okay, go to the bathroom. Who the gonna... fuck won that <laughs> round? Uh, I well, don't we'll, know. we'll take a minute for the audience to choose which story did you prefer while Nash goes to the bathroom. <laughs> that way we can. Everyone won. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not helpful. <laughs> I mean, it's a different the audience. audience anyway. The points don't matter. <laughs> I think the truth is the audience clearly won. They got to listen the to all wins, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the audience won. Oh, I kind of low-key want to switch to a Matt Berry voice now because I feel like I've shot the Australian accent. Narita the Zuma, we are currently uh, playing the Extraordinary Adventures of Baron Munchausen uh, in which our players create incredible, extraordinary stories from prompts that either you donate to or I read out of this book because there's a lot of them. <laughs> Fuck oh. is there ever. <laughs> <laughs> my two stories, one hands down. The good Dr. Taro, I wanted my eyes. Aww. He's a peon, he's a peon, everyone's a peon. <laughs> <laughs> the southern <laughs> gentleman one, Wild Baron. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Every time, every fucking time we do this, we I just see this weird carnival funhouse of bullshit coming out. Of it, it just I, spirals out of control. All right, I'm a little back. sad because I think the uh, I think the best story was the walrus God. story before we actually started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could retell that story if you guys really want. <laughs> Save that for a prompt. And all see right, if you can so Sam, you can pick the order, I guess, this time, so that we're not all hesitating. You can shuffle right. it a little bit. So, who do you want to go first? I'm just going to switch to a f different fucking accent, so because even I hate my Australian accent. Okay, hang on. I As do the Australians. I'm sure the Australians are just happy to be included. <laughs> all right. Uh, Lord Archimedes Kane, Oil Baron of the South. Oh yes. Please tell us how the story of how you laid the ghost of Anne Boleyn. <laughs> oh, <it's laughs> so... I need oh, you to no. clarify this right now. <laughs> you say laid the ghost. Laid the ghost. Which time are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> More specific. I need to know this. Very clearly. Post ghost. <laughs> there was one time he laid her, and another time he laid her so good he laid her to fucking rest. <laughs> this is why I need you to clarify which definition the... of laid are we talking about, because that's two very different stories. One involves a snowman, the other one involves a train. <laughs> then uh, then uh, there was the uh, third time talking... when she came back for more, eh? It, it just says I... the ghost of Anne Boleyn, so. <laughs> I was talking. I was talking biblically or as a member or as a part of his house. <laughs> I think that's up to him. I think that's up to him. I'm not sure he wants to tell at this point. And then there was that one time he laid her so good she was late she had to get a layover. <laughs> I will be a gentleman and tell the kind of story of how I laid her to rest. Because <laughs> the other story is far too graphic for this kind of a crowd. Yes, yeah, Bustin makes you feel good. <laughs> Indeed it does, my good pirate sir. Indeed it does. Sorry, I this story that. takes place three months ago. I had just gotten off of the grandest train that money could buy, the HMS Train 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 McTrain. 
I <laughs> foolishly let one of my sons choose the name. Yeah, just after well, I, 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 uh, I, I'm regretting objecting to this, but uh, <laughs> HMS stands for His Majesty's ship, not a train. How do you account for this? Because it my mighty shit, sir. That is what HMS stands for. Nothing to do with that there fancy queen. It's my majestic shit. It's on every one of my farms. It's on every one of my ranch hands. It's on every one of my chairs. HMS. <laughs> now, Miss Boleyn and I, we've been having a scandalous affair for over eh, two weeks at this point. So I was about ready to dump and trump her just like I do the rest. But she came up and said, There's been a bit of an incident back home I need to hide. And I'm just thinking, I cannot let this woman onto one of my many properties. Or there is a slim chance my wife might find out. <laughs> and if there is a slim chance my wife could find out, there's an even slimmer chance I might have to do something. <laughs> So I decided, why not just get rid of both my problems? <laughs> so I sent her up to a ski lodge. <laughs> Coincidentally, unbeknownst to me, my wife was at that very same ski lodge. Yes, I see an objection. I have a question now. Apparently, I'm not ditching the Australian accent. Isn't it known Good. that Anne Boleyn has a perilous fear of hearts? How'd you get her up the mountain? Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Handling. <clears throat> oh, yeah, she does have a fear of heights. So the trick was to make her believe she was actually quite low. So what I did was I constructed two large fake mountains next to the main one, <laughs> thus making that mountain seem much smaller by comparison. <laughs> As a result, she was on the smallest mountain of the slope versus the biggest mountain. <laughs> Now, of course, this started really confusing my wife because she'd been here many, many times. And so I had to convince her that it was a whole damn new ski lodge. I had to put new portraits everywhere, build new walls. But at the end of it, neither of them knew where they were. And none of them could convince anybody where they were. If they said they was at Rocky Mountain Ski Lodge when they was actually at my ski lodge, I now had the perfect alibi to take care of all my problems at once. So I did the smartest thing I'd ever done in my life. I traveled to Antarctica, and I found Norbert, the legendary snowman assassin. Now you might be thinking he's a man who loves snow, but I kid you not, my good sirs, he is a living snowman that kills for money. I figured he likes to kill snowmen. <laughs> yes, he's very good at his job, as he's the only <laughs> snowman left. He's the man who tracked down Frosty and murdered him in warm blood. Uh, but sir, I actually yes. know of many snowmen. I have three of them under my employ. And you best watch out for them. <laughs> He's a coming. I've never seen a snowman with more heart and ice in his veins than Norbert. <laughs> well, anyway, back to my story. So after I built the two fake mountains and convinced both my wife and her that they were on a different place, this was the time for Norbert to take his approach. He started off at the base of the mountain and crept an inch a day, creeping his way to the top of the mountain. Till eventually, he was just outside the ski lodge. Looking in, he observed all the manner of their rhythms, their schedules, and he could figure out the prime opportunity for him to attack. Well, now, was of course, wife still there this whole time? Yes, why would she not be? I had not given her permission to leave the ski lodge. <laughs> so there she was. <laughs> it was Anne Boleyn trapped in the ski lodge and Norbert ever closer. He watched and he got their schedule. He tracked down their movements until he finally was able to strike. Now, of course, him being a snowman and this being a heated ski lodge, there was a time factor involved. So I came up with an ingenious plan. I hired a man to throw himself in the furnace, thus causing it to crackle, brace, and basically clog up the system. <laughs> This was surprisingly the cheapest part of the entire plan, as it only cost me four dollars. Tom, you're at time. But, 
time you've been at I am not done my story, good lady. <laughs> I think these people deserve to hear the end of this story, but well, if I'm out of time, I'm out of time. <laughs> How much do I have to donate to get him to finish the story? <laughs> <laughs> Are we all okay with him finishing this fucking madcap story? Ain't hey, no one saying no. Let's fucking go. <laughs> I don't know where to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost track of his own plot. So now the seating was prepped and the game was reaching the, the ending point. The furnace was clogged with a dead body. The snowman Norbert was in session. And the two former ladies of my life were prepped and ready. Now, I thought this would be a very clean operation. You know, Norbert's a professional. He's been around since 14 AD. But no, I didn't count for one thing. Frosty wasn't dead. He had tracked down Norbert and was willing to make this personal. So I come back expecting two dead women, and instead I find two snowmen who've been fighting to the death on top of the women. They've been lying there, freezing and cold, living and shivering, almost hypothermic, as I saw two snowmen each detach their nose and start jabbing each other in the gut. <laughs> now, this is pretty funny, I think Norbert right? was caught by surprise, because I'm pretty sure he normally just carries some kind of matches or something like that to torch the other snowmen, but he was prepared. Because he brought a gun. And that gun was for human people. You know, covering up their organs, shooting them in the head. That don't work on snowmen. And so, as I walk in, two snowmen stabbing each other on top of two women close to hypothermia, I think to myself, Archimedes, you can use this. You can use what's happening right here to your own advantage. And indeed I did. For one of those mighty stabs them snowmen did, they nicked Anne Boleyn. And as a result, her blood did splatter onto one of the snowmen. And as they did stab each other more and more, the snow flaked off and was collected into a small pile. And as I saw that brightly colored snow, I thought to myself, I can sell that as a dessert at sports games. And on that day, two snowmen died, Anne Boleyn and my wife died of hypothermia and natural causes as the coroner would work, and I invented the snow cone. <laughs> <laughs> How much did he... Fuck. <laughs> Tom, In retrospect, Tom that was entirely horrifying. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> he needed it to make it official. I'm absolutely donating so Tom can finish the story. <laughs> Pat you back the money, Tom. <laughs> Fuck. I apologize to everyone who had to listen to that. I had no idea sorry. what was going at You're any not point. Sorry. You would have stopped You're soon not... if you were sorry. Sam, who's next? <laughs> that broke me a few times along the way. Oh my god. <laughs> I had a follow-up question at the end where it was gonna be this American psych. Yes, sir! I, I right am taking follow-up questions now! Right. No, no, you're done. <laughs> Give Are you minute. okay, honey? Give me a second to, to, to recollect myself. Okay. We opened the fucking uh, Pandora's box on that one. What the all hell? Alright. Uh, Lord Henry James Edward St. James the Fifth and a Half. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Could you please tell us the story of how you deduced that all the monks of Westminster Abbey were devil worshippers and what you did about it? Oh no, you're hey, muted. Nash, you're, you're, Nash. You're, you're, Nash, we can't hear you. <laughs> right. Now, so... You have to... The thing about devil work is they don't exactly specialize on a specific devil. Because there are multiple different devils. You've got your Beelzebubs, and you've got your Azazels, and you've got your Lucifers, and you have your generic lords. Your Cthulhu. Because, you know, yeah, you've, you've, you've got a couple of them. <laughs> a few Demogorgons in there, too. Aye. Now, it's, there are so many of them that if you're worshipping the devil, you have to, as they might say, yeah, you've got to catch them. You've got to catch them. Eventually. 
And the way I deduced that the monks were worshiping the devils was they were in a desperate race to catch them all. They were competing against each other. They were sneaking around here, there, hither and there, going into the tall grass and, and just all sorts of matter of ridiculousness, trying to okay, catch all the devils. But isn't it true that the monks of Westminster actually took a vow of leglessness and could not uh, <laughs> go about their property like that? Yes, they did. <laughs> they did. They did. But the way they were going about this was they had to fling their balls <laughs> in order to catch the devils. Fuck. <laughs> See? They, they couldn't They couldn't chase them, so they had to fling their balls. It was the most unsightly way of dealing. <laughs> It was a, it was a most unsightly thing. Believe me, I didn't want to have. I I it's in my mind. It's scarred in there. Just these monks flinging their balls all over the place. Not the first time in human history that a bunch of holy people tried to catch monsters with balls. We have a we have an interruption from the audience. Your half highness, uh, your high halfness. Sorry, what happened to all of the black goats? The unholy monks gathered. Okay. Uh, in order to attract the devils to collect them all, you need various and sundry items of different sorts. Like, you, you need very incense. Devils love incense. You can burn the right incense. Or sometimes you need maybe particular shiny fruits. Because <laughs> they, they do enjoy their fruits. Um, the goats were sheared, which is really bad because you shear a goat, you don't get very much. It's just like the, the, the hair. But, right. But if you distill it, if you distill it into an incense, it smells like the dickens and devils fucking love it. <laughs> now, my lord, <clears throat> I do have a quick question for you. As we all know, when multiple devils get together, they do release a foul odor, as we all, oh, as we all know. Oh, yes. Now, I have heard rumors that the minute the Pope smells that particular odor, he goes in an unfathomable rage until all the devils in that area are cleansed. How did you keep the Pope away from all this? You see, the way, the best way to keep the Pope away from all the devils is to orchestrate some sort of, of, of games to keep him occupied. Now, you might not know this, but each church, each diocese, they tend to have sports competitions against each other. They tend to have, okay, and they, they, the place they practice, they have gyms. Each diocese has a gym. So what they did was they have contests. The devil catching monks would have contests to see who could throw their balls and capture the devils the fastest? Right, and they practice in the gyms in each in each of the regions. Uh, we right? Have another, and, we have another interruption, but Lord, did none of them devils require the ball of mastery to catch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the holy ball of mastery of St. Peter. Uh, it's, it's no, I believe that one's attached to the Pope himself, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one belongs to the counter-Pope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a holy relic and they keep it at a very special gym and everyone has ha in order to catch it has to, have to battle their way across the gyms to earn the right to have the holy mastery ball of saint peter is there any truth to the rumor that you opened up a goat farm and a go-go -go bar in wales shortly afterwards <laughs> yes <laughs> Plus, you know, if, if everyone is if everyone is trying to make the most of this, you got to profit on it somehow. <laughs> no, I have a question. Sure. Uh, the gym that the Pope's at. What type of gym? Um, I think the the Pope's gym. It's it's kind of well, it's a little dark there. You, you might you might even call it a little bit shadowy. <laughs> it's like a shadow gym. <laughs> it's a shadow gym. I think. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> That's brutal. Hey, I have a question. Oh. Weren't there other people trying to collect demons along you, and did you not perhaps have to defeat a, a big four, sort of? You might even call oh, yeah. it elite. Well, yeah, the 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 uh, the, the, the monks they, they want to be the very best, the best that ever was, and they they did in fact have to compete with one another. 
and it was vicious and vile. And I believe there was a cat that talked. Yeah, cool. yeah, that was super effective. Ah, <laughs> oh, not to worry, sir. It could have been a whole lot worse. You see, there's an E, there's an evangelical version of this called Dejamon. Not nearly as popular, but you can collect a whole bunch of angels the same way. Except they go into necklaces. Alright. I evolved like a motherfucker, though. Okay, we're Every gonna... time you get a dragon. He's gonna move on to the next thing. Grand Sprinkle Lord Reginald von Kitty Bottom, Archbishop of the Deep Cinnamon Bun Swamp. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Please tell us the story of the time a cat insulted your honor of your family and how you restored that honor. That son of a bitch, I remember this. <laughs> the cat. God, I remember this story so well. <laughs> <laughs> that cat must have done a number on you, sir. I wait with eager ears and anticipation. Oh, yeah, well, so too. did he, when uh, he decided to call me out in front of my entire family and uh, question my lordship over the cinnamon swamps. He th he thought that he himself was the owner of the swamp, and I kind of had to tell him that, uh, that the, this wasn't true. I had wrestled it away from his family fair and squares hundreds of years earlier and uh, made sure to um, definitely uh, change the name from the cat's meow no, I have a question. Uh -oh. I believe he is contemplating. Oh, he froze. Ah, <sighs> oh, that's frustrating. I think you're back. <laughs> you're back, Jura. Where did I lose you? The cat's meow. Yes, I did change it over to the cinnamon swamps as a uh, as a lesson learned that no one goes against Reginald, the Archbishop. And so basically what we ended up doing is pushing all of his uh, his family into the swamp itself and uh, stomping on them while we declared ourselves the gnomish princes of the land. <clears throat> Doc, you had a question, right? Hmm. Aye, I did. So I know nothing brings a man down like an awful puss and you got yourself a bad case of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I I'm wondering how you deal with that. Um, it, well, it's a struggle every day, as you can imagine. As you saw my initial reaction to this, I'm still not over it. Um, but, uh, you know, I remind, remind myself every day that not every cat's going to be a mouthy bastard. And it's going to and it's gonna come at me about my family's lineage. Because uh, they get pushed into the cinnamon swamp, and that's just what gets happened. You know, it's not a deep swamp, it's not a deadly swamp, but, you know, it sure is cinnamony, and cats hate that. It's deep and deadly enough. <laughs> Now, I, have a question. I do have a question. Oh, it, it's, it's how do you attribute to the rumor that the cat is still out there to this day, terrorizing people with catty remarks? Well, he is, and that's the problem. That's why I'm very upset about it. Still, um, the point is that uh, we need to make sure that these cats don't get us so uppity. And I'm sure that the Lord Archibald can can contest to this, as he I can see one roaming around in the background of his room. Uh, now, that, uh, these... <clears throat> sorry, we have a, we have another interruption now. Archdeacon Frozen Bottom, wasn't it true that the cat in question was armed with a team of rocketeers? Uh, yeah, well, that's how he ended up invading the swamp in the first place, and we had to make sure that the uh, rocketeers were no longer a factor. So we ended up clogging up their engines with the cinnamon swamp. Who, you know, it's very viscous and sugary, and it doesn't react well to. And most technology doesn't react well to it, as you can imagine. So, um, we ended up smashing just like into the intake engines, just cinnamon bun after cinnamon bun, and um, all that would come out of it instead of just rocket propellant was um, a, 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 a foul smelling burnt concoction. Um, it just caramelized everything inside of the engine. So, well, I'm we sure it doesn't cover that. No, it doesn't. And we <laughs> checked their insurance policies beforehand to make sure that they would have to pay a sizable deductible based on this. So we ended up having to, uh, so they ended up having to. Uh oh. Nope. Nope. He'll be back. <laughs> Hello. Hey, you are. Hello, there you are. <laughs> And so we ended up having to make sure that they uh, had to pay a sizable deductible to get home with their mangled up Rocketeer packs. 
Mm -hmm. So they'll think twice before they come after me again, or they'll get dropped from their Rocketeer insurance. But I have a question about um, what what years did uh, this take place over between um, the uh, swamp being known as the Cat's Meow to the cat trying to forcibly take back his land? Uh, this was during the Europe War of 1963. Oh, but that is when cats, in fact, ceased to meow for about uh, 70 years. In mourning, uh, for what, uh, for the loss of the cinnamon swamps. True. So fast. They... Pardon? <laughs> so fast. You're quick drawing draw on that. <laughs> so Absolutely. And so they refuse to meow. And, uh, you know, that's a shame because some people do enjoy the sounds of a cat's meow. But um, we're, uh, they decided to get together in solidarity and I couldn't have it. So, you know, you, you kind of it's a lesson I learned from Ender's Game once upon a time <laughs> where you, you crush your opponent into a pulp so they can't possibly ever come back to you. It's uh, on my bracelet right here. What would Ender do? <laughs> you fucking crush your enemies. Alright, well, we're at time. Yes, well, we I've are. Oh. Okay. Alright. Huh. Huh. You okay, Sam? Yeah, one second. I, I, I died, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we need another prompt, though. I know. Alright. All right. Uh, Baron Dr. Zealot Beef Stupid Esquire S Space Bazooka the Fourth the Third. Yes. Please tell us the story of the duel you were forced to fight against a swarm of bees. Oh, this is uh, this is um, a story that I'm very reluctant to tell people because it's so uh, very uh, traumatic to the elderly. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, this was at a time when I was on a big like uh, duel. Uh, um, what, what word would I use? A kink? I don't know. I was I was really into dueling at the time. Uh, <laughs> Tom, it's funny that you settled kink. on the word kink, man. I don't know! Please! <laughs> That's Let the man weird. tell his story! It's not been interrupted! I he fights know. with more than one sword at a time and he's not ashamed about it, okay? <laughs> uh, around that time, I was dueling anywhere from once a week to seven times a day. Uh, depending on the size of the children that I was fighting with. Right? <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, about this time, um, a, a certain Scottish noble said to me, if you're going to pick on such tiny people, why don't you t pick on a, a swarm of bees? And, um, you know, I was I was ready to run because I, I thought he was going to make good on that. And in fact, he did. Um, so... So the bees and I, uh, at a pace of about 30 feet uh, with pistols, uh, we took several steps. Uh, I took much faster steps, um, but uh, there was a wall so I couldn't escape. Uh, so I, I set my, uh, I set my flint, flintlock to um, shoot 100 pellets and uh, hope for the best. I think I killed maybe seven of them. Uh, the rest <laughs> of them I did away with through just flailing. Uh, it, it seems to have done the trick, although I was uh, horribly um, stung, and uh, that's how I found out that I'm allergic to precisely 17 bee stings. Um, now, I've got a question for you, though. Yes. As was brought up in the chat here by SMV, would you call that, say, risky beesness? <laughs> I would, actually. I believe the dictionary definition of risky beesness uh, is from this specific duel, although it's there is some contention in that because there was also the bee duel of 1881 between a swarm of bees and a very angry duck. Um, I also like how the chat just fucking erupted with literally any other goddamn word you could have used other than kink. I know, right? I don't know why I landed on that word. Now, back to the topic at hand. Good yeah. duck, I have a question for you. Yes. Now, considering that you'd been poisoned by said bees and the bees had lost a sizable chunk of their numbers why did y'all not take in your seconds as i understand the bees had a honey badger as their second on account of the honeys in the name so who was your second for this duel and why did you not send them in well it was it was a matter of pride i mean i i had built a reputation of defeating the finest of children and i couldn't <laughs> let the second take my place yeah, yeah that's your reputation you want to hold on to 
I have a question. I do understand. I've heard foretellings of you beating children all the way on my end of the pond. <laughs> no child man. with a clean set of eyes and 40 miles of this man, they used to say. I have a question. <laughs> How are you able to justify you beating up all these bees as they were fully grown adult bees? And you, you have a habit of beating on minors. Well, I didn't know they were adults at the time. I was assured that they were child peas. <laughs> See, that's how he could get away with calling it a kink, is because he was sure that all the bees he was fighting was adults, right? <laughs> now, I do have a follow-up question. This is nothing to do with your story. This is more on my bit curiosity. Uh, isn't there several orphanages on the way between your dueling site and your own abode? Um... Yes, that is true. Do you get past that without strangling all of them orphans? As you keep saying, you are a child, Beta. Oh, oh no, I, I only uh, I only duel with children who consent. <laughs> okay, you know what, this, this is Did sounding way worse than I wanted it to. Because um, so I feel like I... we shouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm um, going to yeah, call it down just because yeah. we're getting... <laughs> Ethical, ethical can child we, beating. Can we right. this? No. <laughs> Stop. Ethical, we did it. We did it. We finally found sources. a story we couldn't finish. We did an ending to something. Yeah, ethical all we had to sources. do was get into child abuse, and suddenly we found a story we didn't want to tell. How weird. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Oh, We're, all <laughs> We're all going to hell. We're all going to hell. Anyways, yeah. that's fine. Tom, you did amazing. You did amazing, man. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dude, you bought like a hundred no, bees. <laughs> you bought a hundred bees and ethically dual children. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mariona has followed us. Thank you, Mariona. She got us. Yes, thank you for following. <laughs> Welcome aboard, you Mariona. The wrong I'm time. so very sorry. All right. Um, this one is a is a prompt from the audience. So, Governor Gary Baldersnatchy. Oh no, that's me. All that right, then hit me with it, you weirdos. Please tell us the time where you discovered that all of the world is merely a stage for the entertainment and amusement for a bored being of immense power. Wait, let me hear that again. I thought we were telling weird stories. <laughs> <laughs> tell us uh, of the ta the time yeah. where Close you discovered home. that all of the world is merely a stage for the entertainment and amusement. For a bored being of immense power. All right then. Well, this is a thesis I've been crafting for many a moon now. As when I started when I was five years old and I took a poop and my parents applauded me. So I figured there might be some merit to this entire stage methodology. So what I would do is I engaged in what is called open public performances. And on more than one occasion, I would just do elaborate things to gain the attention and love of the public. Like punching a child. <laughs> No, stop. <laughs> I'm taking it off of him. <laughs> Which for some reason garnered a plot incredible amount of applause. And so I kept just beating on things and realized that it had become a performance priest piece, which inadvertently caused me to create professional wrestling. For that, I apologize. <laughs> but as a result, I kept going around beating on things to the applause of the masses, causing me. What the fuck is my accent even anymore? I don't know. <laughs> but Cassie's it's like screaming 40... at you. <laughs> it's like 45% Australian. Your accent's well, about as strange well, as your well, fucking well. ideology of digging a bullet out of your friend and then jamming it into yourself <laughs> like that makes a difference. <laughs> so in order to increase the increase the mass appeal of my beatings and to glory, I started beating on bigger and bigger things. And once you hit the tallest man, you're really only just at the smallest bear. How does no one have a question for me? I'm trying to see. I... I'm telling a story and it didn't work <laughs> so far. <laughs> and as a result, my plateaus of attention got more and more involved until the gods themselves took notice. It started very small, of course, with Mephistopheles, lower demon of mischief, but at some point I stopped Zeus in the middle of a good dickin' because he needed to see what I was up to. <laughs> and eventually... I was performing in front of the pantheon of the gods themselves, but at that point, my butt beatings had become an abstract performance, and really just a metaphor but, about my feelings about my father. But I have a question about why Zeus would be in Australia. <laughs> Zeus is always in Australia. He lacks. I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not saying. 
I'm not saying Zeus is, he gets easy. No, he's Zeus not real. saying it. It comes to Zeus, so and that's what we're calling not it. Not only are we all thanking you right now for not going there, but a future <laughs> version of your own self is thanking you in this moment. <laughs> you ripcorded out of that one. Oh, it's just, I heard where that sentence was going to end, and then my brain stopped. Well, Zeus is everywhere. He's in everyone, mostly wives. <laughs> it's good to know that someone in your brain's got a handle on the fucking brakes. <laughs> Thank you. Zeus likes it down under. There you go. Oh, God. <laughs> God, we're skirting a knife edge right now. <laughs> Any further okay. things? Yeah, I got a question. Go ahead. Who the hell is Nicky you? <laughs> what? <laughs> What? No, I'm, gonna say, I'm afraid I couldn't understand them either. Would you mind repeating the question <laughs> so that we might all hear? So who the hell do you think you are? Uh, <laughs> I am the Honorable Gary Snatchy, puncher of growing things that live, and Zeus entertainer. <laughs> and actually, to, uh, to expand on that a little bit, I've got a question. Go ahead. Oh my god, he's got eyes! What happened? <laughs> well, when you run out of things to fight, sooner or later you gotta punch a god. And man, oh man, do gods punch back. I remember my first fight was in a go down with Eros, and I thought, oh, he's a Nancy boy, but man, that bastard's got a name with a bow. Shot me right in the ass cheeky, dude. Made me fall in love with a cactus for about a week. <laughs> Which, let now, me tell you. I do have a quick question there, my good sir. You go right ahead. I may have skipped one or two Bible study classes, but nope. is it not true that when man interferes with godly domains, they are usually smited immediately in oh. war? How oh, do yeah. you avoid them their smites? Because <laughs> you must have pissed off a number of gods. Oh, I didn't. I was smited back to the fucking Stone Age. That's why I live in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Damn, Damn help, you prompt. <laughs> Damn help. Is there anyone who's not mad now or. Ended <laughs> everybody so far? Alright, just gonna end it. I'm gonna end it. There. Just gonna end it there. Okay. <laughs> Stab help. Oh, my accent ain't been the same. See? <laughs> Eating myself out of this. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go for one that's not crazy. Good one. one that might not be. Luck. Um, Fucking try. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just your best there, Sam. All right. Um. Pirate King of the Hudson's Bay, there, bud. Yeah. How are you now? Please, please tell us the story of how you and three rabbits lifted the great siege of Gibraltar. Fuck. All right, well. <laughs> so as you all know, in the early 1600s, Gibraltar was actually located in South America. Of course. Mm, so yeah. all I had to do, instead of getting out of the Hudson's Bay because the ice wasn't melting in this spring, all I had to do, though, was to unhitch the ship from our uh, dock that we had there, and then we just got ourselves flushed down one of the many rivers, like the billion fucking rivers that come out of the Hudson's Bay. That washed us, and we got eventually through the United States, or what would later on be called the United States at this point, uh, peed out of Florida, and then made our way to South America. Easy peasy. <laughs> eventually making our way down to the South Americas, we came across the first place that we found called Gibraltar. Now, Gibraltar was an interesting place. It was two vegetable peoples fighting each other. Now, this might have been where the snowmen got the idea of stabbing each other with carrots, because there was a bunch of carrots stabbing each other with other carrots fighting against rutabagas. You've never seen anything so strange, a bunch of rutabagas in a giant sandcastle fighting off carrots, stabbing each other with carrots. Okay, but uh, isn't the word rutabaga considered deeply offensive in South America? Of course, but we're not here, are they? <laughs> I mean, you switch sniveling. He's telling the truth. <laughs> it's okay for us to say it up here because yes, rutabaga is considered their word, but they can't read nor use the internet, so I think we're pretty safe. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm allowed to make fun of vegetables. <laughs> I'm going to hold that to this. It's all so I've done today, now I want for the record to understand that all I've done today is insult vegetables <laughs> and Italians. <laughs> I mean, they're practically the same. Hey! <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Are you a vegetable? <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> now, my good sir, I do have a question here about here. Yes, this of course. Story go ahead. This story involved a bunch of rabbits. So where did them down rabbits come from? Now, see, it's interesting you should mention that. Because rabbits up to this point had been a myth. They hadn't been invented. <laughs> what they are, in fact, is just a bunch of very large beasts with very big ears. And I thought about that because we were going up against these creatures, all of these carrots, which were clearly the colony aggressors towards the rutabagas. They were colonists, you see. They'd come in looking for gold, and of course the rutabagas didn't have any, so they started murdering people en masse. <laughs> <clears throat> Christopher Carrot Lumbus, we called him. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, <Not> very real. <laughs> it's so, so very real. Uh, Sorry, excuse me, but um, I actually have a friend who is a rabbit, and he told me once in confidence that he was definitely not invented by you. <laughs> well, because it wasn't me who invented him, you see. Because we were thinking about how we were going to get rid of these carrots. We needed to maintain ourselves diplomatic immunity and neutrality in the whole situation. So what we did is we went out to go get ourselves an interesting beast that would come in and eat the carrots and leave the rutabagas alone. All right, we have one So you see, the... we went across the ocean and we found ourselves Dr. Frunkenstein. <laughs> he made us those rabbits. We, we those have... rabbits killed those carrots. We have, a, we have an interruption from the audience. It says, Dreadcab yes, Fire Guy, is it true that the Rock of G Gibraltar is originally a statue of you for victory of the vegetable wars against the Italian rabbits? <laughs> Yes. Well, yes, because of course, Dr. Frunkenstein that we got to invent the rabbits themselves, once they'd come over and destroyed all of the carrots who were invading the lands of the rutabagas, they had eventually then started to set themselves up, having overgorged themselves and then overbred and were taking over the rest of the continent. So I had to stamp them out with these big boots I've got, you see. Because <laughs> there's nothing folks in Northern Ontario like to do more than stamp some small shit to death. Ah, but sir, you must have failed, as we all know, rabbits reign free to this day. <laughs> Aye, yes, of course. They do reign free to this day, but only in some small parts of Australia. <laughs> what? I have a question. Only in some small Explain parts yourself. of Australia, and only the lands that have been fifed to them by the ostriches. <laughs> I Explain yourself, sir. How did the rabbits get from South America to Australia, then? Well, they run really fast, you see, and if they hit the water at a, a sufficient enough speed from South America to Australia, it's actually a lot shorter than the maps make it look. Uh, it's it's just a quick hop, skip, and a jump, and you know rabbits are real good at that. <laughs> That's true. I see no fault in that logic. <laughs> it's like, fuck, he got me. Uh, <laughs> any other questions from the audience? Um, how did you end up getting these stomping boots, as we all know that boots are only legal in in Italy? <laughs> well, you see, I got them while I was over there getting the rabbits because I had a little foresight. Had a little bit of future thought, you see, having to deal with this possible <laughs> rabbit problem becoming an issue. That's the thing, is whenever you buy yourself a tool, you always buy yourself another tool to deal with the first. Just in case the first gets out of hand, especially if the first tool is a living thing. Uh, yes, I, uh, right. I can vouch as I had to deal with that whole stop for whole incident. It's always better to have a backup plan. And well, a exactly, plan. like how you got married and then hired a snowman to kill your wife. <laughs> always have a plan. <laughs> You're at time. Oh. I was really hoping you were going to transition to a story of how he used the country of Italy itself as one large boot. <laughs> <laughs> That's where boots come from. <laughs> That's why they're shaped like that. They're, they're all offsprings of Italy. <laughs> You're Italy's little children that we wear in our feet. Okay. Um. That's how they afford their pasta habit, you see. Yeah, cobblers are a myth. <laughs> all right. All boots are born from Italy like tiny children and we wear them in our feet. <laughs> all right. Lord Archibald... Uh, sorry, Lord Admiral Archibald Busybody. Yes. Please regale Present. us with the story of how you were imprisoned in the cell next to the man in the iron mask 
who pa what passed between you and how you escaped. Oh, for once again, I ended up in France for some insane reason, and through a very through, through a very uh, varied amount of traffic stopped, I ended up in the Bastille again, next to this one chap who's just clanking and clattering the wall next to me with his head. Like, who are you, sir? I said from from uh, my side of the wall. Like, my name is Philippe. Can you please help me? I don't help people named Philip or Philippe. What are you doing, sir? Well, I'm trying to escape so that way I can retake the throne. No, of course not. I hate the French. I'm not going to help you. And all of a sudden, he crashed through to my side of the prison. I went, you're quite strong there for a Frenchman. Like, keep up in the country for a long time. I don't care, boy, where you came from. Why do you have a metal thing on your head? Well, you see, I'm the twin brother of me. I don't care. Who you are, boy? You have a metal thing on your head. Why did you crash the metal? Well, I wanted someone to talk to. Ugh. Hey. For the love of God, boy. Hit the door. But I don't want to go through the door. I picked him up and I used him as a battering ram to... Ah, but my lord. <laughs> when you come back, I have a comment report. <laughs> Frozen, Frozen in fear, he must be, at my intense way. questioning. <laughs> Frozen he battery grabbed right mind. through his router. Like. Frozen. <laughs> oh, oh, there you gone. go. Frozen! No! Oh, that was so frozen! You were all frozen at one point. <laughs> so you got a question. Well, Dad, you... Yes! Yes, yes, I had a question. Is, yes! I, I find a bit of a... <clears throat> I have found a fault in your stories, sir. As oh, yes. we all know, the French a part of being weak will, are also incredibly weak bone. So how, how could this Frenchman's spine survive you using him as a battering ram? How did he not fold together like some sort of accordion? Well, after beating up several of the guards, he did end up turning into a crepe, which I used, <laughs> which I used to distract the remaining of the guards to get their keys, and I managed to escape from the Bastille. And that, that is how, out. once again, I evaded the French. Well, how did you... And left that horrid country. Yes. Well, I have a question, actually. How did you yes. get out of France when Italy was right next door? Because the Italians notoriously hate the French. Didn't you catch them in the middle of one of their idiotic wars? Well, no, the French were too busy fighting the English again. It was a proper war, so I made my way to Italy. Uh... And evaded. And evaded the French once again. Damn this! What? Damn you, Cyclops! Why are you not working? All right, uh, we have uh, an interruption from the audience. It says, "Vice Grand Admiral Fussy Britches, is it true? Did you help this Iron Mast man escape with a box of scraps you found in a cave?" Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I constructed an arc reactor, and that's how we managed to evade. <laughs> With the bright, shiny lights. Yes, I know my video feed is down. Thank you. I don't know what's going on with my damnable camera. One second. I what's have a, a question while you're figuring that out. Yes. So everybody knows when the French are fighting other people, it's like, hello, fucking kitty. But when they're fighting themselves, it's like a nuclear fucking holocaust. Uh, <laughs> using the French to fight other French guards and such, how did you manage to get out there alive? Well, as we all know... <laughs> The one thing that the French hate more than the English is themselves. So I pit brother against brother, ended up in a civil war, and that's how I evaded them. How did you survive the ensuing uh, violence, though? There we go. Welcome back. Ah, oh, yes, thank you very much, Dan Cyclops. You stay working. How did I? How did I evade the ensuing violence? Yes. Well, well, the arc reactor. I would shine in the eyes of anyone who approached me, blinding them. And that's how I was able to evade anywhere that would come towards me. Ah, but I found another fault in your plan. As we yeah. all know, the French never rely on their sight. They use their noses because they can smell cheese from 14 kilometers away. <laughs> so how yeah. in the Sam Hill did you do that? Well, I still had the iron mask from the boy who I turned into a crepe, so I would bash them over the head with that, and thus I would be able to evade the French once again, sir. Thank you for trying again. Do I have any further questions? I would dream of Clash Stingers. Sorry. The French lore deepens. Yes, it does. 
<laughs> I've got one. I've yes. Got I've got one. Yes, sir. Is yes. it commonly known that the French nobility are constantly trying to get themselves? And when that happens, doesn't the Scarlet Pimpernel show up to try and somehow alleviate a very beneficial situation for humanity? Well, you see, he would, except the fact that he is a fictional character. He was made up by a woman, and thus nobody believed in him. That's actually true. The Scarlet Pimpernel was actually made, uh, created by a female author. <laughs> I sort of love that backpedal. <laughs> And that please don't be mad. Very shelly. The scallop, uh, the scallop pivotal is a myth, as we all know. Uh, I, I gotta, does anyone have any questions? I feel that comes to a natural ending to the story. Yeah, there's, there's no need to add more. I feel that comes to a natural. Is, we're gonna take it. All Did right. You say the rest of our endings were unnatural. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Emphatic yes. I did it when Cyclops stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> just just for the sake of everything else, we do not condone beating children. Please do not or say play, so. Or turning <laughs> <Australia. laughs> These are all Please. horrible, fictitious characters. Do not follow their example in any means. Please Unless do you not follow the example of these people. On the side of another mountain. <laughs> to be fair, if you have a stream that's got something like have. seven people who are all apparently billionaires, who are all talking about their lavish and ridiculous stories, then how are they not going to be offensive on some regard or another? I feel like that's a natural thing. <laughs> yeah, to be, to, to be fair. To be fair. To be fair. All right. To be fair. We have about 15 minutes left, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to try and do a collaborative story effort telling. Oh, no. <sighs> oh, fuck. oh, no. For the last 15 minutes and see how far we can go. <laughs> okay. It seems like a bad plan, but... Let's fucking go. All right. <clears throat> For all you lords that are out here today, please tell us the story of how you all collectively uh, converted three covens of Spanish witches to this Protestant faith in a single night. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have an answer that doesn't start with our penises? <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, where I God. was going. That's pretty this. good, sir. Of course you do not start with the penis. As we all know, witches eat them. So we had to come up with a different strategy. Yeah, they do. <laughs> so we had to come up with a different strategy. Now, I kept suggesting perhaps we should just throw Bibles at them, but somebody who shall remain nameless hogged them all and used them for his own war effort. <laughs> And growing I think tomatoes. What was particularly difficult is that one of the witches was already Catholic, which are sworn enemies of the Protestants, and uh, <laughs> and so we, so it was a, a matter of converting all three of the witches in completely different fashions from the others. Well, I it believe, was a three form attack. Well, I believe it was Lord Henry that suggested that we pit the uh, covens of witches against each other in what was called a brouhaha ha ha. This. Wait, what? <laughs> it's a, it's a witch Bru part. Bruja is Spanish for witch, but okay. <laughs> but but see, my, my suggestion was if we wanted them to be Protestant, we had to get, get them into the, you know, a proper work ethic. And that would have done the trick. So I mean, we, you know, got them a proper I, nine to five, <laughs> dental benefits. <laughs> In the end, we just tricked them into a baptism, but I think I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> we're leaving we're leaving out my favorite part, where I pointed out that most witches are entirely made out of wood, so we nailed the Protestant referendum to their front faces, and that pretty much knocked <laughs> it down. <laughs> well, you're skipping all the good parts. You're skipping the part where we tried to bribe them with money. We tried to bribe them with hunks of cheese. We tried to bribe them every single way imaginable, and nothing stuck to them. Because as we all know, witches only want to eat cats. There was a whole part of it where we did try to, in fact, uh, convince them using sex, but one of them threw open their robes, and God, it was just like a tube of tennis balls hanging there. <laughs> a four-pack. <laughs> You okay, <laughs> I'm choking. I was drinking water. That was a bad choice. Oh, yeah. Now, 
We did eventually succeed, of course, but sadly there was a slight hiccup as, you know, one of the adjacent witches, there was a fourth witch, but it was a witch in training that no one cared about, somehow ended up converting into Judaism. Does anyone remember how that part worked out? Well, at the end of the day, really, what we managed to get them into the Protestant church was we just told them that that's where divorce was. <laughs> So, that was the it, only place where divorce was legal, and so in they came. <laughs> is it true that this brouhaha was in a whole lot of hot air with some rich, with some old rich windbags? <laughs> I'd rather you not refer to our esteemed guests this way. <laughs> oh, the, uh... yeah, what do you mean, rich? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is true. If you convert your fortune out of Canadian dollars, I could buy you 13 times over with the change in my sofa, good sir. Dollars, bud. My fortune's in maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> no, strategically, I've invested my entire funds into an AMA file. <laughs> I think we're done, Sam. I don't know how we can continue with this. We need a new prompt. <laughs> Props. Okay, let's get Do we another. even have time left, though? We have ten minutes. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Please tell us the story of why you all collectively are forbidden from wearing the color yellow on the streets of Naples. Well, see, it all started with the Australian fella thinking the place was called Nipples. <laughs> <laughs> no. And we yeah, told them that we every way is God nipples if you until know. we showed up. You see, that's where we're gonna start. <laughs> so speaking well, for myself, defense. I can say that there was definitely some strife with uh, the Europeans and my painted uh, lemons uh, that were actually rocks, and mm -hmm. so the sight of uh, yellow and me together would make most Europeans fly into a rage. Well, uh, also after that's we showed up and started asking if the place was called Nipples, and they kept correcting us, and we kept assuring them that they, the natives of their own fucking country, were wrong. We tried to sell them these rock lemons, you see, told them to make lemonade out of it, and while they weren't looking, we tried to make a getaway. It was at that point they realized that not only did they have only rocks and couldn't make lemonade, but they could be throwing those rocks at us, and they did. And boy, it hurts so goddamn bad. It also yes. didn't help that I hit one of them in the back of the head with a lemon rock and then ran. <laughs> and then this is where I got involved in the story. Now, the town of Naples was not a warmongering city, but after suffering the atrocities that my good co-workers here have done for it, they were in need of a tank. And, well, I just happened to have a automobile of sorts, a go-go machine with a harpoon attached to the front. And, well, I made quite the mint selling it over to the town of Naples. Now, of course, I had to be there to show them how to operate the thing, which led to a bit of a conflict of interest. Now, now I believe, what was it, Lord Ar Archibald, you, you're the one who uh, sorted that part out, did you not? Yes, I managed to broker the peace for you, uh, eventually, when I made my way back from France, that sinkhole of a country. This was right after that civil war you started up right there. Well, I mean, it has to be a proper war with the French now, doesn't it? <clears throat> brother against brother. Perfect French fighting. But yes, I managed, to, I managed to broker a contract between yourself and the city of Naples for your vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I'll remember Which, of course, led to that war, getting all up and in there. But it was left alone. You, uh, Pirate Lord, were starting to come up with a retaliation plan for my go-go machine with a harpoon. But aren't the Italians deathly afraid of wheels? They are. Yeah, seeing as their country been... gives birth to footwear and whatnot, making cobblers an entire meth, uh, <laughs> they got really upset when they invented other forms of travel that wasn't walking in the lovely shoes provided by Mother Italy. <laughs> All right, well, you see, I can actually answer this one as well. See, it is entirely true that anyone of Italian descent has a natural fear of circles, and from that, <laughs> wheels. <laughs> so what I did was I constructed an adjustment for my machine. <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I took the national shoe of Italy, a large boot, and I constructed them in a circular-like shape. So, so as they rolled, it gave the appearance of my go-go machine with a harpoon of that of a merely walking, destructible hulk as it towered and walked across the plains towards my dear fellow men across this place. Now, normally we would have been done in by this large, ridiculous machine, but then the gnome showed up in a transforming train heralded by a large olive man very fond of certain words and sex. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like to tell me how that came about. 
Well, of course. I mean, I needed to get over to the uh, to Nipples and uh, make sure that I was able to join you, as um, I was missing out on the uh, selling these lemon rocks. And the only ride I could find at the time was uh, from a mysterious gentleman with a uh, pink chrome train that uh, has uh, a, a, a way of, of being exactly where it needs to be, exactly when it needs to be there. Um, and so uh, it's almost like I said that I was, fe I was feeling very financially vulnerable at the time, <laughs> um, which is how you summon him by admitting that you're feeling very vulnerable. Um, and then he shows up and says stuff like, I love that word, financially. Yes. <laughs> Of course, travel through Italy is very slow by train, with uh, with all the little links point, uh, poking out of the bottom. Like really it, slow. it would be normally <laughs> extremely slow traveling through all the hills and mountains of Italy up uh, in the north there, <laughs> except that this was the Penetratus and made its own way. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we have we have an interruption from the audience. This is, it says now, why would any of you ever wear yellow? As it is in fact the color that only a trueborn coward would wear. Well, it's because wow. the, the 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 people of Nipples were actually throwing the lemons at us at the time, and so the paint on them was rubbing off on our clothes, and so it painted our clothes yellow based on these rocks. So not only are there just rocks everywhere, no one's got lemons, we're all painted yellow. It's a fucking disaster as this train is rolling in and the, the man operating it is like, Ooh, I can't believe that there's rocks being thrown. This isn't my average Tuesday. Oh, and so... Yeah. This is the part where it gets it. So now I want you to picture this. There's Italians everywhere, all angry. We're all covered in yellow dust and paint. A train is coming over the mountain heading straight for us. I am in my go-go machine with a harpoon, and we are still trying to figure out how to talk to the natives to say this was just a mere misunderstanding about the word Naples versus Nipples. And then things got very interesting. I well, they thought it was real funny that we'd made that mistake, and they couldn't just out and out banish us on account of they were laughing so hard, so they said that we just weren't allowed to wear yellow there anymore. <laughs> and then that's when our friend from Wales showed up. <laughs> yes, you had all those sheep. You had all them sheep with you at the time, and a bunch of flamingos, as I recall. I don't remember no, any of I, I would like to mention <laughs> that the things of. Um, we, we did wait. It's true that uh, the color yellow was associated with cowardly. Uh, up until there was a, a law passed to um, to prevent such association. That's why we we ventured into Italy during that time. We waited until it was okay for yellow to no longer be cowardly. Of course, they reinstated the cowardly definition of yellow after we left. Which was a complete coincidence. Had nothing to do with us. Uh, Are I'm you sure I was fine. there? Oh, you were there! <laughs> oh, you were there! You were there! You were drunk the entire time, but you were present! That sounds like me. That sounds like me, yes. <laughs> you can't say he's from the lines of the sheep. We tried to pass this narrative to Nash, and he just goes, no. <laughs> 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 now, I believe that was when you said, I have a plan. We'll paint all the sheep yellow and hide the village. Oh. <laughs> Sounds I'm like me, so, yeah. Laughing so hard, my stomach hurts. <laughs> oh. Uh, Are we at time? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna call it time. Oh, please, God. <laughs> <laughs> fucking weeping. Ah. Oh. I regret everything. Out there wants to fucking animate this insane goddamn thing. <laughs> oh. Please. Please, someone animate some oh. of these stories. Oh, my God. I, I do not know. need to I see my mountain thanks. story in pictures. <laughs> oh, I, I have God. to thanks to people and <sighs> announcements so what do i do first announcements or things hang on thank you uh thank you all the people who have donated it's mostly rob hagen yeah. uh and <laughs> SMB you, for usa uh for adding into this insanity oh <laughs> thank you all in the audience for enjoying uh, and I'm sorry that most of you have died <gasps> from probably all of the laughter. So <laughs> damn, so have we. Oh, yeah, this, what, was that? what happened? What happened? Oh. <laughs> Why oh, did I... we veer off into child abuse? What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> I... I meant the Come story on. before that was so wholesome. It was about oh, snowman okay, murder. <laughs> you're right, buddy. You okay? No, do you need uh, a hug? Do you mean to come down and give me a hug, bud? <laughs> we have our last question that we're going to answer today from, from Papa John. And it goes, 
what happened? So, uh, <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so first of all, thank you uh, to our players for coming in today for this incredible <gasps> pile of bullshit that we have matted up into somehow two hours of footage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please, if you liked what you saw today, uh, share it out. It'll be on, it's getting processed on YouTube as soon as the stream ends. Um... I need to thank our players. Uh, do you guys want to do a uh, quick sting, or do you just want me to yell your name so you can get the hell out of here? Just yell my name. All right, Stingers. Cool. Yeah. Thank you to Doc. Thank you to Tom. Thank you to Jordan, Byron, and uh, Tom, and uh, Nash for participating today. Uh, please note that everything we said here was very satirical and not based oh. on anything by virtue of the fact that they decided to badmouth all of the Italian culture. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 Mike, Mike, we badmouth no, 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 everyone. I'm shutting you down. I'm shutting you down. Now, uh, D20 Live will, of course, return next Sunday, so if you had issue with anything we said, you can yell at me there for craft check as we build our model kits, relax, uh, shoot the breeze, discuss the geek news, or just stupid news. Uh, in addition, I will be back uh, Monday on the Optimal Duo, twitch.tv slash the Optimal Duo, playing more Super Robot Wars. Uh, um, and Sam will be back there on Thursday. If, you, again, you enjoyed our community, enjoyed the vibe we have here, uh, please join us on our Discord. Uh, follow us on Twitch, uh, Instagram, Facebook even, should you so choose. Um, or just follow us here. We're pretty chill about it. And uh, if you wish to get the notes... Uh, the behind the scenes notes for this game uh, you can subscribe to our Patreon at the $10 tier whatever uh, notes there are it's there, mostly, which, it's there mostly be gonna be a picture of me crying and screaming <laughs> <laughs> mm. That's but, uh, it's just like a super blown out black and white photocopy of <laughs> Sam just freaking out <laughs> might be worth it um until yeah, then, and of course at that tier you get every single note that come out of D20 Live Games. But until then, I have been Big Mike. These have been my wonderful players. That has been Sam, the production manager, who has suffered our adventures. Have a good night. Good night Thanks. Everybody. Night. Bye. Thank you so much. Hey, folks. Bye.